I'm Mark Arenes, and this is Euler's Melting Pot. In this challenge, we try to complete every Project Euler problem in a different programming language. Today's challenge is problem number six. Find the difference between the sum of squares of the first hundred natural numbers and the square of sum of the same. First, we should note that the square of the sum will always be bigger than the sum of the square. Intuitively, this makes sense because the square function grows super linearly. So taking the square of a bigger number should be larger than summing the squares of its parts. But we can also prove it. A plus B quantity squared can be multiplied out, and in the result, we get an A squared term, a B squared term, and something else in the middle. As long as A and B are positive, that middle term is positive, so we have our inequality. If we have more than two numbers, we still get the same result. We get an A squared term, a B squared term, a C squared term, and some extra mixed terms. As long as all of the numbers are positive, the inequality holds. So, it suffices to calculate the square of sum, and the sum of square, and then subtract them. We'll get a positive number, which is our answer. This week, we'll work in JavaScript. We'll keep a running sum of the numbers and a running sum of their squares. As we iterate through the numbers from 1 to 100 inclusive, we'll add to these two variables. Note, there are efficient formulas for calculating the sum of consecutive numbers and the sum of consecutive squares. In fact, there are efficient formulas for calculating the sum of consecutive terms for any power. But we're going up to 100, so it's fairly easy to just do a loop. At the end of the program, we square the running sum, take a difference, and print out the result. One point of note is our variable declarations. If you've used JavaScript for a while, you may be used to using the var keyword rather than the let and const keywords to declare variables. The latter are newer keywords in our, generally speaking, recommended practice these days. For one, the const keyword indicates clearly that you will never change the value of a variable, similar to final in Java. Further than that, the main difference is that let and const are block scope, while var bound variables are function scope. This distinction comes into play mainly when creating closures. Concretely, consider this function. This function creates five new functions returning, respectively, the constant values 0 through 4. We put these five functions in an array and return that array. Inside the loop, the local variable i is captured by the inner function and effectively is stored with it as an extra pointer. We never really have to worry about pointers as the programmer. JavaScript handles all of that for us. However, if we use the keyword there, this seemingly innocuous code stops working. Even though it looks like it's creating five functions returning five different constants, it's actually making the same function five times. With there, there's only one variable called i, and it keeps changing. So at the end of the loop, we have five functions, which all return the final value of the variable i, which in our case is the number five. In summary, it is generally recommended to use let and const rather than var in new JavaScript code, as it produces more intuitive results in these corner cases. Now we've got our answer. We'll get to our language of choice in a minute, but first we need to discuss two-dimensional programming. We can't talk about 2D programming without mentioning Befunge. Befunge is largely considered to be the father of two-dimensional programming languages, and codified a lot of the ideas we see in more recent ones. Each Befunge instruction is a single letter. So this is a program consisting of five instructions. In particular, the two digit twos are distinct instructions, not part of a larger 22 token. The memory model of Befunge is stack-based, similar to golf script. We keep a value stack that's initially empty, and over the course of our program, we push values onto the stack and do some computations on them. This is a simple program which performs the timeless computation of two plus two. First, we push two onto the stack, then we push another copy of 2 onto the stack, then we add them, print out the result, and end the program. This doesn't seem very two-dimensional yet, but we could have also written it like this. You can think of a Befunge program as being sort of like a maze. A rat starts in the maze at the northwest corner and travels east, doing everything he's told as he goes. Some of the instructions might tell him to change direction. For instance, the V in this program, which is intended to resemble a southward-facing arrow, instructs the rat to face south and start walking that way. A rat, in this example, starts at the northwest corner. As before, he pushes two to the stack twice, then adds them together. The fourth instruction he encounters asks him to face south and continue. The dot instructs the rat to print out the top of the stack, and then at ends the program. It's also worth noting that white space is ignored in Befunge, so we can add some extra spacing for readability. This arbitrary right turn might seem contrived in this example, but this sort of grid-like reasoning becomes necessary when we want to do control flow. Let's write a factorial program in Befunge. The factorial, typically written as a postfix exclamation mark, 
is defined to be the product of all the numbers from 1 up to and including its argument. So for example, 3 factorial would be equal to 3 times 2 times 1, or 6. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 24, and so on. The program we'll write will have two loops in it. As a mock-up, this is the JavaScript equivalent of what we're going to do. First, we build up the stack by pushing all of the numbers from our input down to 1, inclusive. Then, we reduce the stack back down, multiplying as we go. Think of it as a recursive algorithm, except we're managing the call stack ourselves. We start in the northwest corner facing east. First, we push a zero onto the stack. This will tell us where to stop looping later, after we're done iterating. Next, we get an integer from the user with the ampersand character. For the sake of this example, let's say the user inputs 6. Now we go south. We duplicate the top of the stack with colon. The underscore instruction is a branch. It tells our rat to pop the top value off the stack, which is in our case 6. Then we go east if the value is 0, and west otherwise. 6 is not 0, so we go west. In this case, we duplicate the top of the stack, subtract 1 from the duplicated value, and repeat. When we hit the V, we've looped back around to where we were, creating a sort of rudimentary while loop. We repeat the entire loop again, staying in since the comparison value is 5, not 0, and again, and again, and so on, until we get to our final iteration. Here, the value we'll duplicate to the top of the stack is 0, so when we hit the underscore, we'll go east instead of west. Then we hit the dollar sign, which pops the top value off the stack. We know the top value is 0, so it's not helpful to us. Now we enter our second loop. We want our second loop to run until the second from the top value is 0. That is, we want our second loop to run until we can see our 0 value that we put onto the stack at the very beginning. Traveling east, we hit backslash, which swaps the top two stack values. We duplicate the top, test whether it's 0. Vertical bar is like underscore, but for north and south rather than east and west. Specifically, vertical bar tells the rat to go south if the value is 0, north otherwise. In our case, the value is 2, so we go north. Star is a multiplication instruction, so we multiply the top two stack elements. And now, we're back at the start of our second loop. We'll repeat the loop again, this time multiplying the 3 and the 2. Then again to multiply the 4. Then the 5. Then the 6. And now, on what will be our final iteration, we swap the stack values, duplicate the top, check our branch. In this case, the top is actually 0, so we go south. We pop the extra 0, print the final value, and terminate. This isn't nearly all the Funch is capable of, and we'll definitely be revisiting it in later videos, but it serves as a good introduction to typical two-dimensional programming. Now, let's talk about hexagony. Hexagony, like the Funch, is a two-dimensional programming language. The difference now is that our program is not a rectangular grid, but a hexagonal one. We'll still have a rat moving around a grid, but it'll be a giant hexagon rather than a rectangle. As a taste, here's Hello World in hexagony. This prints out the string hello world without any spaces. In hexagony, the 52 letters, uppercase and lowercase, simply assign the ASCII value of that letter to the current memory location. We'll get to that in a minute. The semicolon, on the other hand, prints out the value of the current memory location as a character. As in Befunge, our metaphorical rat starts at the northwest corner, this time of the hexagon, and travels east. Since we're on a hexagon, there are six possible directions of travel for our rat. East, west, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. The first few instructions simply assign them to the current memory location and then print out what's there. Then we hit the backslash. In Befunge, we tell the rat to change directions by indicating a new absolute direction of travel. By contrast, in hexagony, we put up mirrors in the form of backslashes, forward slashes, vertical bars, and underscores. When the rat hits a mirror, he reflects off it and continues traveling in the new direction based on the angle of the mirror. In our case, we hit a backslash going east, so we come off it going southwest. We continue printing some more characters, hit two more backslashes at different angles, then an underscore, and then eventually we hit the at sign, which terminates the program just like in Befunge. You can find a full table of the interactions with mirrors for our rat friend on the Isolangs page. It's worth noting that our program doesn't have to be saved in a hexagon shape. We can safely remove all the spaces and new lines, as well as any trailing dots and hexagony will happily add them back internally. So this pretty hexagonal program could be shortened to this. 
Of course, nobody will ever be able to tell what this program does, so in the interests of readability, the programs we write today will look like hexagons. Now, you'll notice that I've glossed over how memory works in hexagony up to this point. This language is not stack-based like Buffonge. Instead, hexagony memory is stored in an infinite hexagonal grid. This hexagonal grid is entirely separate from the hexagon that stores your program code. Hexagony program data is stored in the edges, or lines, on this grid. Each edge can store a single number, and they all start out at zero. There's a single memory pointer which points to one of the edges and has an orientation. The edge it's pointing to determines the current memory location for the purposes of many instructions. The orientation is important for moving about the grid. Instructions like semicolon get the value of the current memory location, the location the memory pointer is looking at, regardless of its orientation. In the case of semicolon, the current value is printed to the screen as a character. There are six instructions for moving the memory pointer. Left brace moves the memory pointer forward and to the left. Right brace, likewise, moves the memory pointer forward and to the right. Remember, the pointer has an orientation, so it knows at all times which way is forward. Equal sign switches the memory pointer's orientation, effectively rotating at 180 degrees in place. Double quote moves it back and to the left, and single quote moves it back and to the right. Finally, there's caret, the conditional move. Caret looks at the current memory value and acts like a right brace if the current value is positive, or a left brace otherwise. Arithmetic in hexagon uses the hexagonal memory model as well. Simple unary operators act in place on the current memory location. For example, tilde takes the current value, multiplies it by negative 1, and stores the new value back in the current memory position. Likewise, close paren and open paren increment and decrement the current value in place, respectively. The numbers 0 through 9 each perform the operation current value times 10 plus n on the current memory value. This may seem arbitrary at first, but if we know that the memory location we're looking at currently has the value 0, then we can use this to store multi-digit numbers easily. To store the number 100, we simply put the numbers 1, 0, and 0 in sequence in our program. If the rat encounters these numbers in order, and the current memory value is 0, then our instructions will set the current memory value to 100. Binary operators are a bit more complex in that they operate on multiple memory locations. The plus instruction takes the value ahead and to the left, and the value ahead and to the right of the current memory, adds them together, and stores the result in the current memory location. For operators like minus where the order matters, the left value is considered to be the first operand, and the right value is considered to be the second operand. So the minus operator takes left minus right and stores the result at the current position. The one other memory aware operator we'll need is the ampersand. Ampersand takes a look at the current memory value, if the current value is positive, then it looks ahead to its right. If the current value is negative or zero, then it looks ahead to its left. Then it takes the value at that position and copies it to the current position. Since this is the only copy instruction available to us in hexagony, we'll be using it to copy a particular memory location in a few places. We've already seen the dot in passing. If a rat encounters a dot, he will harmlessly move on, doing nothing in the process. The dollar sign operator causes our rat to leap over the next position, skipping whatever it is. Finally, there are conditional branches. This is how we'll do loops and if statements in hexagony. The conditional branches are greater than and less than. If we enter the mouth of the operator, then we branch. That is, if we encounter a greater than sign while moving east, or a less than sign while moving west, then we branch. In either case, we look at the current memory value. If the current value is positive, then our rat will rotate 60 degrees to the right. If the current value is negative or zero, then our rat will rotate 60 degrees to the left. The rotations are relative to the rat, so it's rotationally symmetrical in the case of a less than sign. One other minor point that's worth noting is hexagony's wrapping behavior. If our rat runs off the side of the hexagon that is our program, he'll reappear on the opposite side and continue moving in the same direction. We won't actually need this behavior for our program, but it's nice to know. These are all of the building blocks we'll need. Now it's time to discuss where we're going to store everything. If we assume we're starting here and facing up, the starting position will contain the constant number 100, which will be used for comparisons. The value to the left of the starting position will be our counter. It will start at 1, and when it gets bigger than 100, we'll know it's time for our program to stop. The value to the right of the start will be a temporary variable used to store the result of that comparison. 
Offset our starting value, we'll store the current counter variable squared. Next to that, we'll store another copy of the counter. This isn't strictly necessary, but it's convenient and it cuts down on some unnecessary copying and moving around of values. Above the second counter, we'll keep a running tally of the sum. We'll need both positions in order to effectively perform the arithmetic. Down below, we'll store the square of the current counter, and below that, we'll store the sum of squares so far. Again, we'll need two positions to do the arithmetic for that. Finally, linking it all up, we'll use this position for all kinds of temporary storage and for moving values around. All right, let's get started. We begin by setting our constant 100. Then we set our two counter variables to 1. We move the memory pointer back to our comparison variable, and then we begin our main loop. Inside the loop, we take our current sum, which starts at 0, and our counter, and add them together. We use a less than sign here simply to help with control flow. This one is not a conditional. The less than operator only acts as a conditional when we hit the point. That is, if we hit it while moving east. Since we're moving southwest, it simply acts as a sort of weird mirror and sends us west unconditionally. After a bit of shuffling variables around, we move the new sum back into our sum variable. One minor point of note here, we discuss that ampersand copies a value from the left or right memory location, depending on the current memory value. We use the A instruction immediately before that to ensure that the current value is always positive. So the sequence A ampersand will always copy the right memory value to the current set. Next, we use our middle temporary variable and do some value shuffling to multiply the counter by itself, squaring the value. We store the squared counter below our temporary variable, and then we use the same addition trick to add it to the squared sum at the bottom. We use the opposite ampersand trick here. A always pushes the ASCII value of the lowercase letter A, which is 97, and therefore positive. Then tilde multiplies the sequence by negative 1, resulting in a negative number. So the sequence A tilde ampersand we'll always copy the left value to the current cell, rather than the right as we did before. Finally, we increment the two counter variables using the close paren operator. Then we move our memory pointer back to where it started the loop, pointing at the comparison variable. We update the comparison variable by comparing our counter to 100 again. And finally, we hit a branch. This one actually is a branch, since we hit a greater than sign while moving west, ergo hitting the point of the symbol. At this point, our current memory position was set to the difference between 100 and our counter, and then multiplied by negative 1. That is, this memory value was set to the counter minus 100. If the counter is strictly larger than 100, then the counter minus 100 is positive, and our rat will rotate 60 degrees to the right, exiting the loop. If the counter is less than or equal to 100, then our rat will rotate left and loop again. Finally, once we've completed our loop 100 times, we need to take the running sum, square it, and subtract the sum of squares. We use our middle temporary variable to square the running sum, the same way we've been squaring other values. Once we've done that, we move the value down until it's next to the sum of squares, subtract the two, print the result, and terminate the program. Fortunately, unlike BF, hexagony has a single instruction for printing out a number as an integer, namely the exclamation point so we don't have to do anything sophisticated to write a print statement like we did back then. This solves Project Euler problem number six in hexagon. Tune in next week when we take on the seventh problem in whitespace, the whitespace-based programming language.